Marvel's Spider-Man is possibly one of the greatest video games to ever come out. So of course Marvel wanted to capitalize on that with their Gamerverse storyline. Yes, they dubbed it the Gamerverse, not me. And the idea here was, let's continue the stories of that version of Spider-Man. They only came out with a few of them, but here are all of those stories back to back. It's been eight years since Peter Parker was bitten by a radioactive spider, turning into the crime-fighting superhero known as Spider-Man. But all he has to show for it is a low-paying research assistant job, stress, anxiety, and a phone that won't stop pinging with messages from everyone that he knows. As Spider-Man slowly wakes up, he hears the police scanner reporting that there is a level four mobilization at the Fisk Tower. Spider-Man jumps out of bed, beginning to suit up as he calls NYPD Captain Yuri Watanabe asking what the situation is. Yuri tells him that they're all gathering at Fisk Tower and waiting on the warrant. He knows how Fisk's lawyers are. Spider-Man webs out of the apartment, telling them that he's on his way and he's going to be there soon. And 20 minutes later, Fisk is throwing Spider-Man into the ground of his office, asking, did you not think that there would be a fight? Fisk then grabs Spider-Man by the head, slamming it into the ground. But as Spider-Man leans back up, there's a light sound of cracking. He looks down and simply says, Oh, look what you did! You cracked the floor with my head! The floor gives way and the two continue to fight as they plummet down each floor of Fisk's tower. But just before landing at the bottom, Spider-Man webs him up, hanging upside down, asking him, So is this the part where we kiss? Once the police put Fisk in cuffs, he begins to yell, You're going to regret this! I was the one who kept the city in order! One month! In one month, you will all wish I was back! Yuri asks, what is that even supposed to mean? Spider-Man tells her that, I'm not sure. Fisk is a billionaire narcissist roughly the size of a minivan. Probably just thinks the Earth will crash into the sun without his gravitational pull. As the police take care of things, Spider-Man hurries over to his actual job that he's currently late for. Over in Otto Octavius' lab, he sighs, hanging up his phone, stating, Peter can't be late every morning, but it's my lab and my equipment. I should be able to perform a simple test without an assistant holding my hand. So Otto hooks himself up into a harness with four large mechanical arms on it. Peter runs in telling him that he's sorry for being late. One of the mechanical arms then mimics Otto's hand movement and Otto tells him that it's fine. I've invented this equipment, surely I can handle using it. Just as those words leave Otto's mouth, Peter's spider sense goes off and the harness that Otto is wearing begins to shock him. Peter runs over, pulling the plug, telling Otto to hang on. And Otto coughs, telling him, Yeah, just another setback. But we're close. We're real close. Over in Midtown, the young Miles Morales rides along with his father, Officer Jefferson Davis, to school asking, Can we not do the whole interrogation thing? Jefferson laughs, telling him that he just wanted to know how school was. And Miles tells him, No, you were hoping that all of my little girlfriends weren't distracting me from my studies. And as Miles goes to turn the radio on, a report goes out that there's a bank robbery in progress. The suspect is the shocker. Proceed with extreme caution. Miles tells his dad that he needs to hurry. Drop him off and go. Meanwhile, over at the bank, Spider-Man's webbing up the shocker, asking, why do you keep doing this? We both know what happens every time you try to rob a bank. Shocker yells, I don't have a choice. They'll kill me if I don't listen. You can't mess with the demons. Shocker released a blast, throwing Spider-Man out of the building and onto Jefferson's patrol car, with Jefferson asking him, are you okay? Spider-Man tells him, well, it depends. On one hand, Shocker shouldn't be this hard to beat. On the other hand, his new tech is some next level stuff, kind of geeking out a little. Later that night, after Shocker is dealt with, Peter heads back to the lab to go over his suit and look into possible upgrades. Shocker shouldn't have been kicking his butt as much as he was. But while Peter is working, Otto walks up, looking at the suit, asking, why didn't you tell me? Peter tries to come up with an excuse. I mean, he's standing in front of the Spider-Man suit, and then he tells him, well, I wanted to protect my family and friends. Otto tells him, well, I suppose the designer of Spider-Man's equipment couldn't be in harm's way. Go ahead and get back to it. As Otto leaves Peter's office, he stops at the drawing board laughing. And it's quite remarkable. My protege is outfitting Spider-Man. Super science for a superhero. What fun! What tremendous fun! Later, when Peter wakes up at his desk, he sees a note left by Otto on a sticky note attached to his forehead. Check your email. Peter yawns, when the great Otto Octavia still insists on... So he checks his computer and his eyes widen at the designs that Otto came up with for Spider-Man's suit, and he quickly gets to work implementing them. 
A short while later, over at Roseman's auction house, MJ sends a text to Peter stating that she's on to something here. She did some digging into the Fisk story, and it led her to a hidden folder in one of Fisk's statues. It's about something called Devil's Breath and Mayor Osborne's involved. Just as MJ sends her last text, a group of demons storm the place, stating that their boss said that the statue should be here somewhere. But just before they go find MJ, Spider-Man appears over one of the guards asking, Hey, what's up? The other guard points his gun and begins to fire at him, with MJ grabbing a small stone sculpture and bashing it into the demon's head. Spider-Man says, Just so you know, I do read those texts. Sometimes I just don't know how to respond to them. He starts to clear out the remaining demons, but as she is watching in awe, a demon grabs her from behind, throwing her to the ground. Spider-Man swings down, knocking the demon away, but another quickly grabs the file that MJ uncovered and escapes. As Spider-Man is helping MJ up, he sighs, stating, This is why she should have let me do this all stealthy. But elsewhere, the demons who escaped bring the file on Devil's Breath to their boss, Mr. Negative. Mr. Negative looks over the file, telling them, Well, this is good. You've done well. Now, if you'll excuse me. Moments later, at the Feast Homeless Shelter, Peter is sitting with Aunt May as she says that she's just worried about him. He seems so lonely since he and Mary Jane separated. Peter tries to tell her that he's fine. Besides, they're here to celebrate her. Can we just talk about you? That's when Mr. Lee places his hand on Peter's, stating that he's pretty sure that Peter can manage his own love life. But thanks for coming, Peter. Without your aunt's hard work, this place would have fallen apart years ago. May tells Lee to stop. The Feast Support Center was his idea. She just works here. The three laugh, and Mr. Lee says that he's sorry he has to leave them, but he has other business to take care of. As he walks away, he fixes his tie as he reverts back to Mr. Negative. The next day in Midtown, the police hall swarm away with Yuri stating first shocker and now him. She's starting to think that Fisk's parting threat had some value to it. Spider-Man tells her not to worry about it. It's just been a busy week. There will be plenty of yahoos to punch back before they dethrone the kingpin. Just then, Spider-Man gets a call from Otto Octavius. He ducks away, telling him that he's sorry for being late. He'll be there in just a minute, but Otto stops him, telling him, don't bother. Mayor Osborne is here, and now the city is cutting back funding, claiming that right now they are funneling money into a project that hasn't shown results. Spider-Man asks, are you just going to stop? And Otto tells him, no, I will continue on, but I have to do it alone. There's just no way I could afford an assistant anymore. I'm sorry, Peter. With all the recent break-ins on Fisk's properties, the police then focus their attention on places that have yet to be hit. As Officer Davis pulls up on Fisk's shipyard, he reports back to dispatch that everything's quiet. He rolls down his window, shining his light, telling him that he hates to say it, but they can't have vigilantes trespassing or doing illegal searches. Spider-Man swings down, telling him, That's the worst part about being me, always accidentally breaking the law. That and a chafing. Suits real tight. Can't we just let this one slide? Jefferson gets out, telling him, No, that's why I brought a warrant. Besides, my son is a huge fan. Wouldn't be right arresting Spider-Man. But before the two begin to look for clues, a truck bursts out of the garage and speeds off. Spider-Man quickly follows, telling Jefferson to be careful while he takes out those demons. More demons come out of the warehouse, shooting at Jefferson, and he jumps into his patrol car, telling dispatch that an armored truck just left, and he's in pursuit. Jefferson steps on the gas as the demons start shooting at him. And then he turns a corner, and he sees Spider-Man holding a truck from falling off a bridge with the demon speeding right for him. Jefferson punches her, speeding up, crashing his car into the truck before it can hit Spider-Man. And later, as the medics arrive on the scene, Jefferson is loaded into an ambulance, and once the EMTs tell him that he saved Spider-Man's life tonight, they begin to close the door with Jefferson stating, Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Before the door shuts, though, MJ stops and stating, According to a couple dozen eyewitnesses, it's exactly what you did. Officer Davis, Mary Jane Watson, Daily Bugle. Jefferson waves his hand, telling her that he has no comment. He's a police officer, not a headline. And MJ tells him that even though that's true, the news is going to make a story about him one way or another. Wouldn't he rather it at least be the truth? Jefferson laughs, telling her, you argue just like my kid. All right, hop in. The next day, Miles heads to the hospital to see his father when suddenly a demon comes crashing down onto a hot dog stand. Miles looks up to see Spider-Man fighting a group of demons on an out-of-control helicopter, and the first thing that he does is take out his phone. He starts recording as Spider-Man begins to web up the helicopter before it has a chance to fall, with Miles simply saying, that's amazing! Spider-Man tells him that if he framed the shot just right, it might help put him through college, or at least become a great meme. Whatever he does, make sure to tag him in it. Spider-Man swings off, and Miles yells for him to wait. My dad saved you the other night! And Spider-Man stops. It's a small world. Make sure to tell Officer Davis thanks. A few days later, after Jefferson recovers, Mayor Osborne holds a ceremony in honor of Jefferson and his courageous acts of selfishness for their great city. 
He welcomes Jefferson up for a speech, but as he turns to leave, one of Osborne's aides tell him that he has a phone call. Osborne takes it, asking who is it, and a voice on the other end tells him that over the next coming days, his company, his city, and everything that he cares about will be destroyed. Osborne says, look, I get these threats like twice a week, but as Jefferson continues his speech, a man from behind him begins to glow. Down in the crowd, Miles calls out to his father, and when Jefferson looks back, he throws himself on the man who has a bomb strapped to his chest. And seconds later, that bomb goes off. A funeral is held for Jefferson to honor his service and sacrifice for the city. But among the people most devastated is his son, Miles. As everyone comes and goes, Miles stands there, looking at the coffin in silence. Once everyone is gone, Peter walks up, telling him that he's sorry for his loss. And Miles asks him if he knows him. Peter tells him, no, my name is Peter Parker. Not that that really matters. I just wanted to say, and Miles stops him. I know what you're going through, right? Or it gets easier with time. Maybe something about God's plan. Peter Parker sighs. I, I just, but Miles finishes his sentence, trying to help. I know the problem is you can't. Miles turns and begins to walk away, telling himself, I can't give up. I can already hear my dad's dumb fatherly voice. You can't always stop bad things from happening, but a hero never gives up. A few days later at the homeless shelter, Miles walks in stating that he knows he's late, but Peter tells him it's all right. He's just glad for the extra help. Peter brings Miles into the back to help May prepare food when suddenly his phone goes off. Peter says that he's got to take this, and if they need anything, be sure to let him know. He walks off asking MJ what's up, and she tells him that he's not going to believe this, but Mr. Negative is Mr. Lee. Peter asks how is it even possible, and MJ says that it's true. She was going through her photos at City Hall, and there he was with demons in one of her shots. Peter tells her that it must be a mistake, but MJ goes on stating that she did some digging. Feast is legit, but his other businesses are all shell companies. Fronts for all of his shady activity. It's all here. She can, but that's when Peter's spider sense goes off and he starts to hear voices. Seconds later, a few demons come in and one says that the boss told him to get the guns and get out. He doesn't want any of his do-gooders seeing them. Peter clings to the ceiling as he watches and another demon says that the homeless shelter has a pretty sick front if you think about it. Later that night, Spider-Man hears a report over the police scanner about a break-in at Oscorp, finding a group of demons raiding Mayor Osborne's office. Spider-Man quickly takes the thugs out, telling them maybe if they had better masks, they would put up a better fight. You can't see that good in those masks, right? Now, you're going to tell me exactly why Martin Lee has you digging through the mayor's underwear drawer. One of the demons coughs, telling him that they won't say anything, and Spider-Man shrugs, telling him, well, it was worth a shot. But as he finishes, he feels his spider sense going off and he's shot from behind by an electrical shock. Armed soldiers dressed in white run in shouting for him to freeze. And Spider-Man tells him, not cool. And later after the demons escape, Mayor Osborne arrives with Spider-Man telling him, this wasn't a random break in and we both know it. Norman tells him, I know very little about it as it would seem the thieves have gotten away, despite my best efforts, of course. Spider-Man points at the security guard telling him, yeah, your crack team there attacked me instead of the bad guys. Just then, a woman walks in pointing her guns, stating that she saw a mask breaking and entering. What did you expect them to do? As she finishes, a small device is thrown, shackling Spider-Man to the ground, and Norman introduces Silver Sable, head of Sable International. Spider-Man says they're unable to move and says, Hi! Meanwhile, over at Sable International Base Camp in Central Park, MJ sneaks in and begins to turn off the generators providing light. With the soldiers running to see what happens, MJ quickly goes into a tent where a man talks to himself, stating that Osborne's crazy for bringing him here. He should have destroyed Devil's Breath back at the lab. MJ stands up telling him that she's sorry. She couldn't help it over here. Is he the scientist working on Devil's Breath? The man jumps up, pointing a gun at MJ, asking if Mr. Lee sent her. And MJ tells him no, she's not with demons or Sable. Her name is Mary Jane Watson, and she is a reporter following a lead. She wants to see Lee stopped just like him. She came here for answers. What is Devil's Breath? Why does Lee want it? The man lowers his gun, telling her that Devil's Breath is his nightmare. GR27, Osborne's pet project an AI-controlled CRISPR genetic code modification. And if perfected, Osborne could cure any disease with a push of a button. Huntingdon's cystofibrosis, poof, gone. It works too well. The viral delivery mechanism cures the disorder, but then it goes after the immune system. Eats the body from the inside out, not just the subject either. It's highly contagious, spreading to the whole population. Every rat in the lab died within a week. This thing could trigger a global epidemic, and all Norman cares about is that it's a PR nightmare. He's terrified that Mr. Negative and those demons will get a hold of it. A voice then asks, 
ruined you. Smart man, that's exactly what I plan to do. Lee walks in, converting to Mr. Negative, and holds out his fist, telling him, But to first. Later, at Grand Central Station, Lee and his demons gather up the hostages, including MJ, and they put them all together. Lee calls Norman, telling him that he'd like him to come to the Grand Central Station in 30 minutes alone, or he will have more blood at his hands. Lee looks at the Devil's Breath bomb, and then turns back, telling everyone, This is your lucky day. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to meet the mayor. Over at Otto Octavius' lab, he begins to go through his testing and finally fixes a critical error. He tells himself that his body may be deteriorating, but his mind is as sharp as ever, more focused. His arms and his legs can give up, but his brain will persevere. He'll throw away the old, tired meat and he'll build anew. Otto gets up, putting on his suit, and then he attaches the neural implant. Once activated, his mechanical arms come to life, all moving to Otto Octavius' thoughts. Back at Central Station, MJ sits on the phone with Spider-Man, telling him, Okay, I see four wires, two blue, one yellow, and one red. What exactly am I supposed to do with this? Spider-Man begins to explain how to defuse the bomb, but then he begins to trail off. MJ asks him if everything's okay, but Spider-Man says, Well, I'm currently fighting Lee in a subway, so uh, give me a sec. He kicks Lee into the control panel, shocking him, and then he goes back to his call, stating, Okay, did you get all that? She stares at the bomb with two seconds left, stating, Yeah, and basically just clips some wires, which somehow worked. Spider-Man tells her good, because right now he needs to figure out how to stop a speeding train since he knocked out the brakes. He climbs on top of the train and begins to jump ahead of it, webbing up the tracks and pulling it back. The train follows up the tracks that he yanked up, and then it comes barreling onto the street, slowly coming to a stop. A short while later, Yuri Watanabe asks if he ever thought about capturing one of those creeps without destroying half a city block. Spider-Man tells her that he thought about it for like an abstract second. But while Lee was taken into custody, over with Otto Octavius, he reads the scans when he suddenly hears Norman Osborn speaking on TV to the news. He tells the media that the crisis has come to an end. Martin Lee, also known as Mr. Negative, is now behind bars. And just know that when he makes a promise to his city, he'll keep it. So when you're casting your vote, remember what happened here today. Together, they are safer now than they've ever been before. But Otto Octavius destroys that TV shouting, LIAR! Even back in school, Norman was always the smiling face, the silver tongue, that's why Otto Octavius left Oscor. But Norman was always trying to find a way to bring him back. And right now, Norman has no idea what he's gotten himself into. The next day, out on patrol, Spider-Man spots an overturned truck and swings down to help the drivers out. He asks if everyone's okay, and one of the guards tells him, yeah, the guy who attacked them just wanted the devil's breath thing. They were transporting it back to Silver Sable. Spider-Man helps him out, telling him, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. Any idea who this was? And the other guard says that it was some bald guy. Looked like an insect. No offense. So Spider-Man looks at the markings, telling him that it's okay. Technically, he's an arachnid. And he scratches. Well, there's only one thing that could have done this. Later that night, Peter meets up with MJ to look through Otto Octavius' lab to try and find clues. And Peter explains Otto Octavius' medical situation. He uses his prosthetic tech to create these arms and in turn, attacked the security truck that was carrying Devil's Breath. MJ asks, why would Otto do that? And Peter says that that is what they're about to find out. So after a few moments, MJ then asks what the picture on the computer means. It looks like a brain scan. Peter tells her that that's exactly what it is. Otto has a degenerative neurological disorder. He is rapidly losing motor functions, which is why he's working on an advanced prosthetic. As the image changes, showing a very much different brain scan, Peter goes on telling her that this is Otto's brain now. The neural web isn't isolating his motor neurons. It's affecting other parts of his brain. And if this is right, his entire personality would be wildly different. In the wrong hands. Those cybernetic arms. MJ stops him, telling him that they have bigger problems now, though. Otto already has the devil's breath. Meanwhile, out on the city, Otto climbs up to the top of the billboard of Norman, telling him that all these years, all these lies, it's all over, Norman. Time to show the world what you really are. 
what you've always been. Otto holds out the devil's breath over the street and he begins to crack the canister of the infection open. The red mist showers on the people below and as Otto puts on his gas mask, he asks, I wonder how Norman's going to try and spin this. Later that night, Spider-Man responds to a call from Yuri Watanabe that there has been an attack on Rikers and that they need his help. Spider-Man tells her that he's already there, but what the heck happened? She explains that it was a coordinated attack. Every cell block has been breached. They have about five minutes until every prisoner is just walking up Fifth Street. Spider-Man then asks, what about the devil's breath? And Yuri says that she's not sure. All she knows is that Sable's troops are handling that. To make matters worse, the entire population has escaped, including Martin Lee. And five of your worst enemies are now on the loose. Spider-Man lands right in front of Rhino, Vulture, Martin Lee, Scorpion, and Electro, telling Yuri, You don't say! The five quickly overpower Spider-Man, punching him and slamming him into the ground, and then they all step on him so that he can't get up. After a few moments, they step back, and Lee asks, Have you had enough? And Spider-Man tells him, No, not yet, still kicking! Just taking a little me time. Just then a claw grips down in front of him, and Otto Octavius looms over him. Spider-Man asks him, what are you doing, Doc? And Otto tells him that Osborne will get what's coming to him. Otto lifts Spider-Man up and Spider-Man begs him not to do this, but Otto says, this is your first and final warning. Stay out of our way. He throws Spider-Man's body over the ledge and then turns back to the villains, telling them, it's time we brought the city to its knees. As the weeks begin to pass, The city is quarantined and crime begins to run rampant. With half the police force infected by the illness, things have gone from bad to worse with all of Riker's escapees still free. Most of the city's hospitals remain closed by order of Mayor Osborne while he tries to develop a serum to fight back the infection. The public gather around the closed hospitals demanding to be let in, but all of Sable's soldiers tell everyone that they need to stand back from the barricade. As the crowd gets unruly, Sable orders the soldiers to give her a show of force and try to calm the people down. The soldiers begin to switch their guns to stun and one asks if they're really going to do this. Are they really going to attack civilians? The first soldier tells the others that an order is an order. Tase them if they cross the line. But before they can open fire, Spider-Man webs up the guns, swinging down, kicking the soldier, telling them, you really should be reevaluating your career choices. Another soldier throws his gun, telling him, hey, I'm with him. This whole thing sucks. Spider-Man kicks in the doors, allowing the people in, and then he gets a call from MJ. She tells him that she may have snuck into Mayor Osborne's private penthouse. Spider-Man shouts at her, what? And MJ says that she found the mayor's skeleton closet, and it's crazy. The story is, Oscorp experimented on Martin Lee when he was a kid. There's even a video. Norman started all of this. They turned Martin Lee into Mr. Negative. And there's spiders here, so maybe they're trying to reverse engineer your powers? MJ then starts to take pictures and says that she sees where Oscorp is cooking up the anti-serum. It's on the Upper West Side. As she begins to focus, she bumps into a shelf and knocks over one of the spider containers. A few moments later, Silver Sable runs in asking, Who's there? Show yourself! Spider-Man asks if MJ is still there, and as a spider is crawling up MJ's coat, she tells him that he needs to get here now. So Spider-Man tells her he'll be there in 20 seconds, 30 tops. And MJ yells, please be here in 20. 20 seconds pass and Spider-Man sees MJ running and jumping off a balcony. He swings in catching her asking, what were you thinking? Silver watches as the two get away and she reports back to Osborne that the redheaded reporter was snooping around at his private office. She escaped with Spider-Man. There's crackling over the comms and Silver asks if everything's okay. But a short while later, Spider-Man lands on top of the Feast building, dropping MJ off as he hurries back off. Miles meets them asking MJ if it ever stops being the sickest thing being friends with Spider-Man. As a spider from Norman's office crawls off of MJ's coat, she tells him no, it's pretty sick. You just get better at hiding it. That's when Miles yells, ouch! And MJ asks what happened. He holds up the radioactive reverse engineered spider that Norman Osborn was trying to use to recreate Spider-Man's powers telling her that it's nothing. You just got a bug bite from this weird spider. Later, over at Oscorp's anti-serum lab, Spider-Man fights with Lee, telling him that he needs to stop this. There are people who are sick. Just give him the anti-serum. No vendetta is worth killing half of New York. Lee shouts that he can tell that to Osborn. 
but Spider-Man webs up and throws himself through Lee's projection, knocking him out. He then takes the anti-serum from Lee's hand, and that's when Spider-Man hears the sound of metal being ripped apart. Otto drops down from the ceiling, asking, Why is everyone but me so utterly useless? He grabs Spider-Man, slamming him into a wall, telling him, There was ample warning. The kid gloves are coming off. After repeatedly slamming Spider-Man into a wall, Otto lets go. And when he stops fighting back, he turns his attention on the anti-serum and Norman Osborn. Otto picks it up and tells Norman that he should see the look on his face. You can't imagine how satisfying that is. He escapes with the anti-serum and Norman Osborn. And back at the feast shelter, Aunt May begins to cough and then she collapses. Later, back at the feast shelter, Silver Sable runs in holding Spider-Man, telling everyone to get out of the way. Miles quickly clears a bed and a man with silver asks, are there any doctors here? Miles says there's no doctors. It's mostly him running the place at this point. And the man says that it's on him. He'll do his best. Let's prep for surgery. Sometime later, Miles is sitting next to Spider-Man, telling him that it looks like the surgery went okay. His spine was all jacked up and he saw ribs poking into things. Dr. Miles seems surprised that he even made it. it. Said something about him healing faster than regular people. Once the doctor was done, he and the angry Sable lady took off somewhere. Who knows? We almost saw Spider-Man die on the operating table and... Spider-Man leans up, holding his stomach, telling him, Ah, you stepped up to help. Great in crisis, not a bad thing. MJ comes in, stating that they thought they were going to lose him, and Spider-Man pulls down on his mask, telling her, That's definitely not my best minute. Smile leaves to give them some time alone. MJ hugs Spider-Man, telling him that there's something he needs to know. Spider-Man stands in front of Aunt May's bed, and MJ explains that the doctor said she could go at any minute. Spider-Man looks down and says that he needs that anti-serum. But he's not sure if he can beat Otto. MJ tells him no, maybe not. Spider-Man might need help from his friend Peter. Peter helped build Doc Ock's arms, right? If anyone could think of a weakness, it's him. I'll go get him, Tiger. So Spider-Man leaves and May wakes up stating nicely done. MJ always knew how to push his buttons. MJ turns back asking, you knew? And May tells her that she's dying, not dead. She's never been a fool. Peter was always better when he was with her. Later, outside of Oscorp, Otto Octavius hangs Norman over the ledge, shouting for him to tell the truth. Tell the truth for once in your entire miserable life. Norman asks him, you want the truth? Fine. The truth is Otto Octavius was never worth a damn when he worked for Oscorp. The truth is, you can never accept that I'm better than you, Otto. You're a failure and you will always be. Otto throws Norman over the side asking, A failure? I'll show you a failure! Just before Norman can hit the ground, Spider-Man grabs him with Norman yelling, Yes! Spider-Man! Go get him! Spider-Man jumps onto the roof wearing a new suit, telling Otto that he doesn't want to do this. Give me the anti-serum, please! Otto lashes out telling him, You are fighting the wrong man! Osborne is the villain! Spider-Man begins to web up the mechanical arms, jumping down onto Otto, telling him, of course Norman will pay, but first, Otto rips Spider-Man off, throwing him to the side, shouting, No! Dr. Otto Octavius is calling the shots now! You are such a disappointment, Parker! Spider-Man looks back, asking, You knew? And Otto yells, I tried to warn you! Spider-Man slingshots himself, punching into Otto Octavius, knocking him down, and the giant antenna that he was latched onto over the ledge. Otto grabs himself, stabbing into Spider-Man's chest, asking him, Who is the villain now, Parker? Spider-Man yells, I am trying to save lives! Remember when you were helping people? And Otto leans in, telling him, I wanted to change the world. I was the kind of man who made the hardest decisions. Spider-Man shouts, I couldn't agree more! and he reaches around Otto's neck and he rips out the implant. Otto falls off the side of the building and onto a pile of rocks. Peter takes off his mask and Otto tells him, I saw you as a son. Should have known you would turn on me. Peter asks him, turned? I worshiped you, your mind, your conscience, the way you never gave up. You were everything that I wanted to be and you just threw it away. Otto coughs, just hand the implant over. The neural interface just clouded my mind. We can fix this together. Peter walks up telling him, I'm going to get you the best help that there is. And Otto shouts, no, they will put me away. They will take away my arms. I will be trapped in this useless body. Don't abandon me, Parker. Peter, Peter. And Spider-Man left him there. Later, 
Spider-Man returned to the shelter and Dr. Michaels told him that this is enough anti-serum to replicate, but it will take a day or two to make. Spider-Man asks if they have enough to just save one person. And Michaels tells him that if they did that, they wouldn't have enough to save the rest. Michaels gets up telling him that he'll be outside. The decision is his. May coughs, looking over, telling Spider-Man to take off the mask she wants to see her nephew. Spider-Man slowly pulls it off, telling her that he didn't want her to worry, and May laughs, stating that she did. But she was always so proud of him. Ben would have been too. All those people he saved. Spider-Man looks at the anti-serum, telling her that he doesn't know what to do, and May holds up his arm, telling him that yes, he does. He gets ready to inject the anti-serum into May's IV, telling her no, he can't do it. He can't. And that's when Peter puts the small vial down and he holds Aunt May's hand. With her passing, Peter had the support of MJ and Miles. And three weeks later, Peter and Miles decided to get an apartment together. Things between him and MJ began to look good and all that's left was to settle in. However, once Peter was alone with Miles, Miles told him that there's something going on with him, physically. Peter scratches his head stating, well, you're about that age where, and Miles tells him, whoa, 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 no, no, it's not like that. It, might be better if I showed you. Miles jumps up, sticking to the ceiling, telling him, It's pretty weird, right? Peter shrugs, jumping up to join him. Nah, it's not that weird. A swarm of bees is chasing him, so Spider-Man zips away on a web line. Can a person develop new phobias laid in? He jokes. Cause like, I've never been especially scared of bees, hardworking, industrious creatures that only sting in self-defense. Inside the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, the swarm of bees continue to chase the web slinger as the swarm, the villain, watches on. You disrupt the hive of the mighty swarm! The villain cries and Spider-Man flips through the air, submerging himself in a small pond. Yeah, in hindsight, that was foolish. He nods, shooting his web out of the water and snaring Swarm. Leaping through the air, his fist then connects with the wrapped up villain. Sort of my job, you know, following evil home. Spider-Man leaps in for another punch, but his spider sense suddenly goes haywire as the bees begin to escape the webbing. You cannot contain us, spider! A voice from all around calls to him. We are many, we are one, we are growing. Spider-Man swings away as the bees attack him, stinging hard on his backside. He then falls amongst the flowers, looking up in time to see Swarm escaping out a window, surrounded by his hive. Let us be, Spider-Man. If you seek out our new hive, you will perish. Swarm calls as he escapes. Spider-Man pulls himself up from the ground, dusting the dirt off of his uniform. Credit where it's due, honey man. Leave us be was by far the best pun of the night. With the battle over, Spider-Man begins to leave the gardens, limping with his wounds. And he tells his phone to remind him to create an armored spider suit. Defense against pokey, stingy, zappy villains. His phone then buzzes. Across the city, Mary Jane continues to text Peter, filling him in on the new story that her and Ben Urich are working on. They stand outside of a comedy club as an EMT tells them that the attack looks like all of the others. Looks like he took an invisible beating. The woman tells the reporters. The man grumbles and complains behind them. To be honest, I kind of want to beat him with a curling iron myself, she tells them, letting them know that the other victims all pretty much sucked. Believe it or not, there's usually something to that, Ben tells the EMT thanking her. The two reporters head inside of the comedy club, where the elder the owner is trying to straighten up the destroyed room. Bringing them back into her office, the old woman informs them that she didn't have any surveillance cameras and had to ban cell phones from shows. No privacy left, she huffs. But it's the world that we live in and within minutes, Mary Jane finds cell phone footage of the attack online. The video is already trending on social media. She informs them holding up her cell phone. Couple of different angles. Watching the feed on the phone, they watch as the comedian continues his set. When suddenly the microphone lashes out, wrapping around him and he gets thrown backwards as the microphone is shoved into his mouth and he's thrown off stage. So later, our two reporters are walking through the streets. This has to be fake, right? MJ asks. Yulrich nods, telling her about a story that a friend of his did 15 years back. But that's when the cars in the street begin to honk and shake with their alarms going crazy. MJ stares in shock as Ben is suddenly thrown, crashing into some trash cans. Before she can react, she's tripped, landing hard and being dragged. Let go of me, she screams, being dragged off. Later, Peter leans over the desk in his new and still tiny apartment, working on a piece of equipment when the door bursts open and MJ pushes her way in. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, Peter! She breathes, gasping as she slams the door shut behind her. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay! Uh, hate to contradict, but you don't seem okay, Peter tells her, swiveling in his chair. 
MJ quickly fills Peter in on what happened, the invisible beating, the dragging, and she finishes it off with, Ben and I were attacked by a ghost, she tells him. A smirk plays over Peter's face, and MJ gets a stern look in her eye, telling him not to look at her like that. A few minutes later, Peter is pouring a cup of coffee, trying to calm her nerves. He couldn't help but laugh every time she said the word ghost. He smiles, apologizing as he leans down to hug her. I believe you completely. We just have to dig a little deeper because Spider-Man can't punch a ghost on account of they don't exist. So realizing that Peter doesn't believe her, MJ quickly changes the subject, pointing at the gear that Peter is working on. He smiles, holding up the sketches of the armored spider suit he had an idea of. Working title, The Arachnite, he tells her proudly. Thoughts? She grabs the sheet of paper staring at her boyfriend. I thought you fought a sentient bee man in a giant garden earlier, yet my ghost story is ridiculous. So the next day, Peter meets MJ at the Daily Bugle and the two of them go searching for Ben Ulrich down in the building's old basement. There they find the old reporter searching through past stories. I found the old ghost story I was telling you about, he tells her, handing MJ a folder. She flips through all the old notes, discovering that the reporter died while investigating an illegal genetic testing at Oscorp. Holy crap, Ben, this is wild! Later into the day, MJ continues to look through the file, questioning whether they could be the same tests that created Mr. Negative. Could be, Peter tells her over the radio. Why do I get a feeling that you're not super focused on our equipment test, partner? He asks her. She just points out that she's multitasking, glancing at her computer to let him know that there's a robbery in progress, it's still in progress, and according to the GPS, you're swinging up now. Peter nods, standing on a rooftop overlooking the city. As darkness falls over the city, a rack knight steps out of the shadows. He narrates in his best gravelly voice. Okay, no? MJ responds, and Peter leaps into the alleyway, stalking forward. His keen sights set squarely, evil doings afoot. Peter, stop. But a rack knight? It's not a thing. Fine. I'll be boring old Spider-Man. He sighs, stepping out into the alleyway, walking casually towards the men loading up the stolen goods in the back of a van. Evening, gentlemen! I was wondering if you could help me out with something. We're conducting a little field test of my new armor. Thought I might let you get a few good licks in before I web your thieving butts to the wall. He tells them with a wave. The first man rushes him, swinging a pipe and cracking it into his armor. There you go, swing for the fences, Peter tells them. The group all come over, throwing everything they have at the web slinger. Ha! Actually sort of fun just standing here for once, Peter notes. And finally he turns, raising his arm to throw a punch, but the armor whines as the servos lock up. A little stiff in the shoulder for being honest. Hot potato, something's burning. Peter notes his body then locks up and he hits the ground. The thieves all rush him, kicking him while he's down. You okay? MJ asks. I'm sort of trapped in a mobile, which sucks, but the armor works great. Can't feel a thing. Finally, Peter manages to get his arm free, removing some of the armor. This is why we run tests, he tells the group, as he flips amongst them, kicking and webbing them up. I sincerely appreciate your participation, fellas. Literally, couldn't have done this without you. Later, after he's beaten them all up, Peter and MJ sit at a diner for dinner. MJ, still pouring over the notes from the old file, apologizes, realizing that she's ruining date night. Peter just smiles, telling her that it's fine, as he flips a piece of sushi into his mouth. But the sushi just hovers there for a moment, before a bite is taken out of it. The whole table begins to rattle as a voice speaks to them. You can't run fast enough. You can't hide deep enough. I'm everywhere, lady. Throw that file in the trash. You and the trench coat need to back off. The whole restaurant begins to rattle as tables and food lift into the air. Peter's spider sense begins to go crazy. What is this? Peter cries as MJ begins to float. I don't know. Probably science, she tells him. Peter sighs as he looks up and MJ tells him to hush. A Peter Parker loud sigh is the deepest, darkest shade, she tells him as she opens up the door to the magic shop that they're about to enter. I'm not trying to throw shade. I told you I'd come with, he tells her, looking around at the strange sights in the magic shop. Just as a scientist, I just trust this whole hocus pocus occult stuff with every fiber of my being. MJ nods, looking over her shoulder. Well, as a reporter, I don't leave stones unturned, and your science has been wildly unhelpful so far. The back curtains part, and the owner enters the shop. Greetings and salutations, fellow mystics. I'm Quentin Beck, owner and proprietor of the Black Rabbit. He greets them. Quickly, MJ tells him about their ghost problem and wants to know if he can help. Um, communicate with the undead? Peter sighs, and Quentin smiles, ushering them into the back room. The three of them sit down at the table as Beck prepares. Traditional science can be a bit murky, you see. Direct lines to the other side being so very hard to come by. So I like to mix in a little bit of card reading and crystallology. Pierce the veil as thoroughly as possible, you understand? Peter nods, looking around the room, asking about the cameras and sound equipment. Just wondering when we can expect the show, he asks. 
but Quentin smiles at his skepticism. Let's see if we can't open up Peter's mind, he says as they prepare to begin. Suddenly, all the lights go out and the room begins to shake and glass vials and shelves shatter, spilling their contents. I already told you what I want! A voice booms around them. How hard is it, lady? Tell the old guy to drop the story. Stick your stupid noses somewhere else. Don't make me tell you again! Everything stops fluttering back to the floor and the three look around shocked. That was freaking incredible! Quentin shouts, a smile on his face as he looks back through the footage that the cameras captured on his phone. MJ asks him what can he tell him, what did he do for that reaction? And Beck tells her, that wasn't me. I'm not a fraud or whatever, I believe in this stuff truly, but I've never experienced that before. I hadn't even started the seance yet. He smiles broader, looking down at his phone, asking if they mind if he uploads it to me too. Only if you send me a copy first, MJ tells him. So the next day, the two of them return to the Daily Bugle, with MJ telling Ben that he won't believe what happened. If it involves our spooky friend trying to scare you off, I believe it. So does my dental hygienist and everyone in line at the bagel store this morning. Ben quickly tells them that he found some videos from the store that his friend was working on before she died. Most of it's pretty dry, clinical trial footage, but this last one's a doozy. He tells her hitting the button. The image changes, showing a doctor logging his video as Oscorp genetic testing phase 4. Subject, James Harvey. Metabolic bombardment, the doctor says into the camera. He steps back, revealing a man strapped to a machine. It hurts, Harvey tells the doctor, but the man shrugs it off, telling him that it's normal. Suddenly, there's a flash of light and the man seems to be gone, and a woman rushes in crying over her lost husband. No, Mrs. Harvey, your husband hasn't gone anywhere, the doctor tells her, and the three watch the video stunned. Some kind of genetic torture, just like Martin Lee, only worse. Norman Osborne just killed that guy, MJ gasps, but Ben tells her that he didn't. There are interviews of the man months after this video was shot. The group is then interrupted as Robbie Robinson, the editor of The Bugle, comes in, telling MJ that her story on the disappearing food throughout the city is late. Disappearing food, Peter whispers to himself, starting to put things together. Later, Peter swings into a back alley in his new armored suit, with a group of gun runners looking up as he leaps into them. One grabs a machine gun, firing it at the web slinger. Spider-Man, get him! The thugs yell. Get me what? Spider-Man asks as the bullets bounce off him harmlessly. Is it candy? Because I'm not a big flowers guy. He swings his fist, knocking another gun away as the bullets ricochet off the body armor. His webs then lash out, swinging a motorcycle and knocking another group to the ground. Looking up, Peter notices a man arming a rocket launcher and aiming it at him. Moment of truth, he whispers, and the alleyway erupts into a ball of fire as the rocket destroys everything around them. Spider-Man stands there, the flames licking at his shiny new suit. I know I'm ruining my badass Terminator firewalk moment by talking, but that was delightful, he tells the goons, when suddenly his phone buzzes. Hey, what's up? MJ asks as Peter activates the comms. Just working. New armor passed with flying colors. We still a gopher tonight? He asks. Across the city, MJ is rushing towards the Daily Bugle, telling him that she's headed to the basement to look for more tapes. Just be careful. It's dark and spooky, Peter tells her, and she hangs up, heading into the old file room of the Daily Bugle. The door then closes behind her, and suddenly she hears the voice again. How many times do I have to tell you? Back off! You're the one chasing me! Who are you? MJ yells, racing through the stacks of the old files as paper and boxes are thrown around the room. Why do you care so much? MJ demands. There's no story here! Don't make me hurt you! The voice yells at a VHS tape is thrown at the reporter. But it phases right through her, and MJ smiles. Gotcha, ghosty! Other images of MJ suddenly begin to appear around the file room, all taking a bow. My boyfriend's a scientist and rigged up all of these cool holograms. We had many projectors around the room. The real me's still upstairs. I had a feeling you'd be moving so fast you wouldn't notice that I never actually came down here. No! The voice screams. MJ dials Peter, telling him that he was right. Or this is the first ghost in history that can't walk through walls. It would be the first ghost in history either way. Peter tells her. Outside, MJ opens the door, revealing Peter hanging there in his armored spider suit. Why do you smell like fireworks? She asks him, looking at the smoking suit. I got blown up. It was epic. The two go back inside, slipping into the security room to watch the monitors. And hours pass as Peter works on his suit. Is it possible for eyeballs to dry all the way out? MJ asks, staring at the screen, bored because they still haven't seen anything. Uh, yeah, but it takes a while, Peter tells her. When finally she yells for Peter to come over, pointing at the image that appears on the screen. That is not the man from the videotape, Peter says, looking at the teenage girl. Nope, but you got the first part right. Look at her go, as the girl is zipping around the file room, locked in there. Now what? MJ asks, and Peter begins to put on his armor, telling her that he simply runs down there and grabs her. 
I made a few adjustments, he tells her. Peter begins to move through the building, opening the door to the basement. Spider-Man means no harm. I come in peace, he says as he goes into the room, showing his hands. But the girl suddenly zips through the room, rushing towards him. I was locked in a concrete box for 11 hours. Do you know how long 11 hours feels to me? She shouts at him, throwing a fist, but using his new velocity suit, Spider-Man dodges it, trying to web her up. But the girl breaks free, managing to land a punch of super speed. She dashes to the door, but Spider-Man beats her there. The girl doesn't slow down, slamming into him hard and breaking the door off its hinges. In seconds, she is tossing him out onto the street. Okay, you're fast. Peter gasps as he slams into a wall, cracking his armor. The girl tosses him and Spider-Man struggles to his feet and the girl quickly moves around, stealing food from a bodega and a hot dog cart. Thought some of that rage was me being hangry, but I'm all kinds of full now. Turns out it's just plain old rage, she says, rushing at super speed back at Spider-Man. Sucks to be you, she tells him, dusting the crumbs off her mouth. The fists begin to pummel rapidly into Spider-Man's face, and a high-speed punch sends him sailing into a nearby ambulance. The speedster rushes him again, yelling for everyone to leave her alone, and another blow knocks him across the street, but this time Peter reacts, swinging away before the super speedster can launch him into another wall. He begins to crawl fast, his suit keeping him at top speed. This is not okay! He yells, careening around the city, and finally he crashes into his office, taking the door off the hinges. The power core in his suit pulsating as it threatens to go critical. But he rips it free in time and the whole world slows down. He turns vomiting as he rips off the helmet. Quit playing it safe, Peter. He tells himself, rubbing the spittle from his mouth. Mad science problems require mad science solutions. He says, quoting Dr. Otto Octavius. Time passes as Peter works on the equations, finally adjusting the specs on his velocity armor and a smile pulls across his face as he works out the issues with the suit. Later, MJ calls Ben Urich to his office, where the man is reading about the death of James Harvey, having died in a fire. MJ is excited, believing that she might know the identity of the mysterious ghost. Does anyone know if James Harvey had a daughter? She asks. Ben flips through the files, and he finds that Harvey did have a daughter, Haley Harvey, who managed to survive the fire that took her father's life. She's a junior in Midtown High he tells her, letting her know with a few taps on his computer that he doesn't have the address. But it's a school day if you want to try that. MJ agrees, letting Ben know that she thinks Harvey had powers that he passed on to his daughter. She hangs up with the reporter, telling him that she'll call him soon. Ben leans back in his office chair, but before he can get comfortable, he's lifted up into the air, the office trembling and the desk splitting in half as everything is thrown around the room. I don't want to hurt people for being slow, the voice yells as she lifts Ben by his tie. So I warned you over and over and over again, I don't want to fight Spider-Man. He thinks I'm one of his gross villains because of you. She snarls, pausing as a voice calls out from behind her. You're talking too fast, kiddo. Spider-Man calls out to Haley as he flips across the room. He can't even hear you at your speed. I don't want to fight any more than you do. I'm just trying to get you to slow down. Peter doesn't pause, though, rushing into the girl at top speed, slamming her into the wall. She pushes him off, kicking him away and dashing out of the room. Before he gives chase, Peter turns, webbing up Ben before he can fall and hit the ground. Hang in there, Ben, he shouts over his shoulder as he speeds out of the room. Ben hangs there, stuck in the webbing with his glasses askew and his office falling apart. What the hell just happened? The speedster dashes up the side of the building, glass shattering beneath her feet from the sonic vibration. But Spider-Man is right behind her using the velocity suit, trying to talk some sense into her. She turns, punching him, trying to get him to leave her alone. And meanwhile, over at Midtown High School, MJ notices Carla Harvey leaving the school, with the mother irritated by the parent-teacher conference she just had. Carla Harvey? MJ calls out, and the woman turns, asking who wants to know. Mary Jane Watson, Daily Bugle. I'm researching a story that may involve your daughter. Carla gets a suspicious look on her face, glancing over her shoulder. We shouldn't talk here. Follow me, she tells her, and they walk away with MJ explaining the situation, unaware that Carla is texting her daughter. Meanwhile, the super speedster fight has brought the two of them to the park. Please, kid! Peter calls out, but Haley isn't listening. She whirls on him, throwing another speed punch into his chest. <laughs> I'm sorry, Peter tells her, but these speeds are too dangerous. I can't let you run around like this. Haley just whirls around, dashing over the pond. If you could catch me, you would have. Peter tries to stop her with his webbing, but it barely slows her down. Her phone then buzzes with a warning from her mother that a reporter is snooping around, and in an even faster blur, 
Haley suddenly dashes away. At the Harvey residence, Carla pours MJ a cup of coffee, explaining that Haley's powers only started a couple months ago. We thought we were done with the nightmare. After the fire and that ridiculous murder investigation, Carla then turns away, letting MJ know that she knows the original reporter was sent by Norman Osborne to root James out, to cover up his mistake. That doesn't sound right to MJ, though, and she flips through her notes. According to my notes, James reached out to Maggie himself. He said he wanted to out Oscorp, shine a light on their illegal genetic testing, save other people from suffering like he did. Carla drops the pot of coffee, shock on her face. No, she whispers softly, and suddenly the living room is thrown into turmoil as MJ is lifted off the ground. The room shakes with the couch lifting into the air as the TV cracks. What are you doing in my home? Haley booms, throwing MJ back and forth across the room as her mother comes in, trying to yell for Haley to stop. But the girl isn't listening anymore, running around the room so fast that sparks are beginning to ignite and her body begins to smoke. Spider-Man leaps into the room from the destroyed window. Sorry, I got this, I got this. But Haley isn't listening as she bursts into flames. Spider-Man collides with her and the two are thrown out a window. You set me on fire! Haley yells at the wall crawler. Uh, I didn't. Peter yells back, shooting a web, swinging away. Even though Haley is on fire, it doesn't seem to be affecting her as she beats against Spider-Man and his armor. They both start to ignite though, with Spider-Man's webbing snapping and they plummet into the Hudson River, dousing the flames quickly. In the cool water, Spider-Man turns with Haley drifting away, knocked out by the force of the impact, so he grabs her, swimming to the surface. Back at the Harvey's apartment, MJ is dusting herself off as Carla runs in, dousing the flames of the fire extinguisher. I got it, I got it, she yells, and MJ stands there looking out the shattered window. So, what happened? Haley just happened, Carla sighs. She sits in a battered chair, telling MJ how she blamed everyone for what happened to James. Filling my daughter's head with anger her whole life. I had it all wrong, didn't I? I thought they got him killed, not that he was trying to do something. Suddenly, there's a blur, and Haley is laying on the couch by MJ. Her mother runs across the room to her daughter, and around them, Spider-Man is moving fast, trying to explain to MJ that he's been chasing Haley all day, and that she's moving so fast it sets oxygen on fire around her and she's losing control. We have to keep her here. I have to slow her down and you can't see me or hear me, can you? I'm moving way too fast to perceive. Spider-Man suddenly realizes that he's just moving way too quick. So he quickly grabs her notepad and writes down everything that he just said, letting it settle over the girl. With it done, he dashes out of the house, moving through the city, eating food to store up calories, leaving the money to pay for it behind, but he can't stop. He ends up going back to the lab, trying to discover a cure for Haley's problem. And in a matter of seconds, he studies and learns molecular biology. It's been three minutes, Frankenstein. I am the prize, he tells himself, testing out a theory, having to wait 10 seconds to see if he's right. Time crawls as he's watching the beaker. Good God, it's gonna take 10 seconds, he sighs. And with time to spare, he dashes out of the lab, patrolling the city, stopping criminals, saving citizens. The whole city seems to be standing still as he leaps and runs around them at speedster levels. Central Park is noiseless, with the digital billboards being nothing but white, set to a frequency that Peter can't perceive at his current speed. But he keeps swinging, suddenly passing by a cloud of motionless bees. He stops following them back to the swarm's new lair, but the villain isn't moving either. Everything is stopped. So Peter quickly ties the villain up, leaving him gift wrap for the police to find. 10 seconds pass and Peter returns to the lab with the experiment finally being over. And he stares at the results for a brief moment before throwing it and destroying the lab around him. His temper tantrum complete. He stops, breathing steadily. He returns to the Harvey residence where MJ and Carla are still motionless. He doesn't know what to do. Hey, MJ, I know you're in the middle of this infinite coffee chat, but I am freaking out and I need to vent. I had a solution, or at least I thought I did. He dashes around the room as they continue to be motionless, and he explains everything that has happened within the last 10 seconds. And he stops, hanging before her. What do I do now? He asks, staring into the face of the woman he loves before kissing her on the forehead. Great idea, babe. Thanks for the talk. He tells her before flipping out of the apartment, and at super speed, he's suddenly standing in front of his aunt and uncle's grave. Hey, you two. MJ says hi. He places a bouquet of daisies on May's grave. Carla had fresh daisies. I know how much you love her daisies, he tells her, and Peter leans down at his family's grave, telling them that he's feeling cut off and just needs to talk. Spider-Man can't punch through this one. There's no super science to it. 
She doesn't need me. She needs the two of you. Back at the apartment, MJ reaches for her forehead, having felt something. In the living room, Haley comes to, struggling off of the couch, and Carla moves across the room, trying to stop her daughter. But the girl is gone. She runs through the city at super speed, looking for Spider-Man. Webbed letters on the ground, asking her to slow down, but she refuses as the flames begin to spark around her body again. She blasts through all of his web traps, which slow her down for only an instant. And in that time, billboards on Times Square suddenly light up, showing Spider-Man's face. Hey, it's Haley, right? How do you like the code name The Blur? Spider-Man tells her that she can only see this message and he hopes that it would slow her down. I'm hoping we could talk, he tells her, appearing behind her. The girl turns, anger flashing in her eyes. Keep on hoping, she shouts, throwing another punch. Haley turns on the web slinger, ripping him off of his webbing. Listen, you're obviously plenty mad, but not at me. Spider-Man tells her not bothering to fight back, but while she has him, he slaps a disc on her back, and that disc explodes, expanding a super fire extinguishing foam. Little something I cooked up, Spider-Man tells her as he swings away. You know, while you were sleeping. Haley screams at him, stuck fast for a moment. She wants to know why Spider-Man is just messing with her. You were on fire. I put you out, and I'm trying to help you through this. I know it's scary. It has to be scary. He tells her landing on a construction crane close by. He runs forward, staying ahead of the expanding foam. But while you're so white hot mad, I can't get through. So I arranged this little timeout. The moment doesn't last though as Haley moves her feet so fast, she pulls herself free of the foam and begins to rush at Spider-Man. As the girl chases him around and around, Peter continues to try and talk some sense into her. He understands where she's coming from. The world just wasn't great to her. And now she has these powers. You're angry and you can project that anger onto me, but that anger will burn you out. He tells her as she continues to try and grab him, when suddenly she slips through, unable to stop on the industrial lubricant that he has spread all over the roof. As she begins to regain her footing, she slams through a wooden water tank, putting out her flames for a few more minutes. I hate you! She screams at him. No, you don't. I'm Spider-Man. People love Spider-Man. Peter tells her, shooting more webs at her. See, twice before you set yourself on fire and I put you out. No thanks necessary. He tells her, spinning the webs thicker and thicker, and that's when she finally stops, unable to move. This isn't funny! You're not funny! She tells him, talking down to me like I'm some stupid kid. Like I don't get to be mad! But Peter keeps talking to her, resting on the tank over her. I don't think you're stupid. I fought stupid, and your anger is completely justified. But Peter knows her anger will get you, and he climbs down to her, telling her how he felt after his uncle was murdered. He knows what she's going through, living with the death of her father, trying so hard not to end up like him. Then one day your powers kick in, you inherit his speed, his gift, and you turn yourself into a ghost. Peter looks in the girl's eyes, asking her to come back so that he can help her. Stop it, just stop it, you can't save me! I was born like this, and if you're right, if these powers are gonna burn me up like they did my dad, that's life, and I'm not slowing down. It's not like anyone can cure me. But Peter responds to that by pulling out a vial of green liquid. Actually, I worked up a vaccine while you were out. I'm pretty sure I can cure you. If I wanted to, but I don't. Peter says, smashing the vial in his hands. Shock plays out across Haley's face, but quickly turns to anger as she snaps herself free. Why would you do that? She screams. Spider-Man swings away, trying to move fast as the girl is now rushing at him. And she slams into him with the two of them falling down towards the street below. As they fall, Haley continues to yell, continuing to slam onto Spider-Man with her super fast punches. But Spider-Man doesn't fight back. Haley, listen, something scary is about to happen, but I've got you. Hold on. They slam into the ground at super speed, cracking the pavement, sending cars flying around them. Are you okay? Spider-Man asks, struggling to his feet. But Haley is up ranting about why would Peter destroy the cure? Because how much worse would this city be without Spider-Man? He asks her. How many people would be worse off if someone had taken my powers away back before I knew what I was doing? When I was a scared teenager just using my new tricks to do bonehead teenager things. The power core in Peter's armor begins to pulse as it overloads and he reaches for it. I'm not taking your father's gift away before you have decided how you're going to use it. I do think I can help you regulate your speed, but if you want my help, you're going to have to slow down. Peter rips the core out of his chest before it's able to explode, disabling the speed of the velocity armor. Hours later, MJ is on the phone with Ben, giving him the information for the story, but unsure how he will write it without exposing the girl. Ben smiles, telling her that she'll be the one writing it. After she hangs up the phone, MJ turns to a battered Peter struggling through the window. Oh my god, Peter, I was so worried. What happened? She says, helping him to a chair. I'm not sure. The suit blew up, and I woke up alone in the street. 
Peter tells her. He tells her that it could have been worse though, since Haley didn't kill him and she doesn't seem to have burned up. I guess she heard me. She slowed down. Days later, Haley finds a newspaper in a box waiting for her on a fire escape. She reads the MJ article, realizing that she made the story about her father in his quest to expose Oscorp. She yells out the window, wanting Spider-Man to know that this doesn't make them even. And as she looks at the box, this better be a box full of cookies or concert tickets, she grumbles opening it up. But a smile pulls across her face as she looks inside. Moments later, she's streaking through the city in her new suit. Haley, the note read inside, a wise man once told me, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. A smart man once helped me build a high-tech super suit, and the best woman I ever know helps me off the ground a thousand times. Twist clockwise for fast, counterclockwise for slow. I'm here if you need me. Go be great. Spider-Man. As Spider-Man is sitting outside the Manhattan Museum of Contemporary Art, he tells MJ that her source was right. There's a small army of late-night art enthusiasts shulking around the place. Who knew the Magia crew was so cultured? MJ sits back in her chair with her coffee, telling him to be careful. If Hammerhead is really making a play to fill Kingpin's spot, and Spider-Man tells her that collecting art is a weird place to start. And it looks like someone cut a hole into the skylight. Just then, Hammerhead's men crash through the front doors of the museum with their cars, and Spider-Man gets to work taking down the bad guys. As some of the gunmen open fire, Spider-Man jumps back onto the protective layer of glass, stating that he's really thankful the security wall is bulletproof. But as Spider-Man webs up the goons, Black Cat jumps in through a hole in the wall on the other side of the protective glass, telling him, hey there, sexy new suit. She then drags her nail along the glass, asking, what? Are you running solo now? Or maybe you're back with Red. Just curious. Spider-Man tells her that he heard that being curious was bad for cats. Hey, stop that! Don't steal that painting! She smashes a painting over her knee, catching a flash drive, telling him that she wasn't planning on it. So Spider-Man stops. How did you know that that was in there? And how are you involved in this? She points over at the thugs, telling him that she'd love to tell him, but she's in a bit of a rush. And he's otherwise engaged, so see you later. She finishes by scratching a heart onto the glass and then takes off back through the opening that she created. Spider-Man begins to think about how things used to be. You see, one night, a long time ago, Spider-Man was hacking into Kingpin's security when he happened to run into Black Cat, who also happened to be stealing from Kingpin that same night. Now, being a hero and all, Spider-Man doesn't usually make a habit of helping thieves escape, but he was going through some stuff at that point with MJ. So while he fought with Kingpin, Black Cat watched while collecting more things and, well, she escaped. And with a web catapult, Spider-Man was able to quickly snatch Black Cat before she got too far. He told her that they would probably just hit up a post office so that she can mail all that stuff back and pretend that none of this ever happened. She leaned in, saying to look at him, giving her a second chance. And then she whispered, asking, do you know what's sexier than a man who can keep up with her? But before Spider-Man could answer, she told him, nothing. With a cute little smile, she jumped off before Spider-Man slammed into the side of a building. She blew him a kiss, telling him that maybe next time he can keep up. However, that wasn't the end of their encounter. You see, later, Black Cat decided to steal from a bank vault, and Spider-Man told her that she should probably put that stuff back. She swiped, tearing into his mask, and Spider-Man shouted that he just broke up with the love of his life. Give him a break here. He couldn't be Spider-Man and the guy that she deserves. Black Cat shrugged, telling him that this conversation is making her feel a little weird. But she does have some advice. She cracked him with a briefcase, stating that if this girl thinks that she deserves better than freaking Spider-Man, he's probably better off without her. Of course, he followed her outside. And just before he could escape, Spider-Man managed to web up her bag and take it back. She told him, wow, he could keep up with her. And after she wrapped herself around him, well, they kissed. Back in our current time, Spider-Man calls MJ, stating that he just ran into a bit of a snag. Black Cat may have been here, and MJ asks, really? Now? He goes on telling her that he's catching up to her now, so they'll have to call her back in a second. MJ then hangs up, telling him, sure. They'll talk about that later, though. As he lands on the balcony, Black Cat tackles into him, stating, hey, but suddenly, more of Hammerhead's men come after her, chasing her down. Spider-Man says that she really shouldn't be messing with those guys. But as she breaks open a small statue and pulls out another flash drive, she says that she likes to play, though. He groans in frustration, webbing up the men and follows as Black Cat escapes again. Once they stop, 
Spider-Man asks what is on those drives, and she tells him that she isn't entirely sure, to be honest. All she knows is that she needs them or Hammerhead is going to kill her son. Spider-Man pauses for a moment, thinking back to that night at Black Cat's apartment in her bed without his mask. After she disappears, he swings back home, telling himself that Black Cat could have a son. It's not a big deal. People have kids, right? He would know if it was... It can't be. Well, could be, but no. They were super careful and totally responsible. At that moment, MJ calls, stating that she did some digging on the Hammerhead situation and she thinks she got it figured out as to what Black Cat is up to. A few years ago, the crime families agreed to a joint accounting database in order to keep the peace. Put all of the assets into one place and require all five data drives to access it. Spider-Man says, so Hammerhead is using Black Cat to steal them drives. And MJ finishes the sentence telling him to steal the assets from the other families. Hammerhead is planning on a get-rich-quick scheme while also bankrupting the other families in the process. Spider-Man tells MJ that she's amazing, and she sighs, stating that, well, she tries. But, uh, any idea when he's going to be home? Spider-Man looks into their apartment from a nearby building, stating, Soon. Real soon. He hopes. And with that, he goes across town chasing Black Cat. But he'll head home as soon as he's done. MJ tells him to take his time. She just, well, she misses him. Goodbye. As the call ends, Spider-Man asks himself why he can't just go in there and talk to her. Tell her, what is he so afraid of? He didn't do anything wrong. But back in the past, where this all began, Spider-Man found himself being punched by Shocker as he attempted to rob an electronics store. Shocker yelled, Spider-Man, 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 everywhere that I go. As Shocker walks in closer, Spider-Man kicks him away, telling him, because your kind of shopping involves blasting big holes and things and robbing nice salespeople at gauntlet point. Shocker punches Spider-Man in the chest, telling him that he's just going to have to kill him then, and Spider-Man responds to him, telling him that that would be first-degree murder, which means more jail time, Shocker. But just before Shocker could attack, Black Cat bashes him with a flat screen, telling him, hey, just take a step back, okay? Spider-Man gets up checking on Shocker to find that he's out cold, and he turns to Black Cat. Nice. She smiles, stating that she figured maybe she could try the hero thing, since, you know, he was so nice. No more stealing if he teaches her how to be a hero please. So later that night, Spider-Man takes Black Cat out on patrol, stating that they just came across some bad guys with guns. He's gonna make some noise, and she slips in and takes them down. Easy enough. So she jumps off, telling him, great, and then we'll get some cocktails after work. Spider-Man sighs, stating that they don't drink on the job, and then he swings into the warehouse, asking everyone how they're doing. With them distracted, Black Cat grabs one of the guns and begins to fire, stating, all right, Hands where I can see them. Spider-Man dodges the bullet, telling her to stop shooting. And once everything is over, Black Cat asks how she did. Spider-Man tells her, well, your infiltration was good and no one died tonight. So I guess we're gonna chalk it up to a win. But after taking down the vulture, Black Cat realizes that being a hero isn't all that is cracked up to be. While getting ready to pose for cameras, Spider-Man grabs onto her, swinging off, stating that they don't stick around for cameras. They don't do this to get famous. Black Cat says no, but it's a nice benefit. Who knew doing this would be so lame? Now back in our current story, not the past story, Spider-Man is chasing Black Cat down a subway, shouting that she can't be stupid, she can't do this alone. She hops onto a passing train, asking, why not? I've done everything else alone. And then she claws at some electrical cables, saying the way he wants to do it won't get it done. Hammerhead has her son, and she will take care of him. Spider-Man tumbles over the wires, telling her that she can't get rid of him. He's not leaving her alone, and she knows it. As the train moves above ground, Black Cat jumps off, running across a rooftop, when suddenly her leg is webbed up, causing her to trip and fall. She slams onto the ground, but before she can roll off, Spider-Man catches her, telling her, Look, we need to talk like human beings. I know what's on those drives. You can't give them to Hammerhead. Let me help. She asks, what is he thinking? And Spider-Man then says that they need a few days and they're gonna find her son. She smiles, telling him that she really did miss him. Okay, sounds fun. The two of us back together again. Spider-Man tells her, no, 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 not like that. She laughs, telling him, right, big red, shame. Spider-Man then asks about her son. Is there like any chance that I'm the fought? But Black Cat cuts him off, telling him, later. When her son is safe, they can talk about that. Now, let's go find him. Later, MJ is walking home after meeting a contact, telling herself that she just needs to relax. Don't blow this thing up. Don't pick a fight. She trusts Peter. She's always trusted Peter. She's just being weird and insecure for no real reason. But as she looks up, she sees Spider-Man and a smiling Black Cat swing beside him. And she sighs, stating, great. 
So a short while later, Spider-Man crawls through the window of MJ's in his apartment, stating, Okay, first off, I'm sorry it's late. I was kind of hoping you were already in bed. But since you're obviously up, there's something I need to talk to you about. There's a thing that Black Cat told me, and it kind of shook me. MJ sits with her coffee in a dark corner, telling him that if he wants to talk, then talk. And after explaining everything currently going on with Black Cat, Spider-Man says that Black Cat didn't say much about her son, but if there's a chance, he just wasn't sure how to tell MJ. MJ sits back in shock, stunned. Oh, wow, Peter. Spider-Man says that he knows that she's mad, but it's not like he... She holds up her hand, asking, Did you know what it was like for me back then? Knowing that you had started to date a super sexy burglar like 15 days after we broke up, Peter? All I was doing back then was looking up everything about her and you. I couldn't understand why you were already over everything. Like, what the hell were you even thinking seeing a career criminal? I felt alone and abandoned and scorned and I wanted to lash out, but instead I sat with it. I was the one who broke up with you. I wanted to be happy for you because I love you and I've grown up. I'm not angry that you dated another woman once, but what I'm upset with is that you didn't come and tell me about it sooner. That in your mind, our relationship is not strong enough to get through this. But before Spider-Man could answer, a call comes through the mask and Black Cat asks, what's the word? Find the address. MJ gets up telling him, cool, tell her that we got the address. Hammerhead owns a warehouse down by the docks. I'll send you the schematics to your mask. Spider-Man gets up telling her that she's amazing. And MJ says, right, amazing. Later, as Spider-Man arrives at the warehouse, Black Cat jumps on his back asking what's the plan. He tells her that he's really sorry about what Hammerhead did. But Black Cat jumps off onto the warehouse, stating it's okay. Hammerhead is about to find out that if you mess with the cat, you get the claws. Ten minutes later, and several goons webbed up later, Spider-Man asks why do they all have the Sable International gear? This is some pretty serious stuff. The Hanging Man says, Yo, this ain't 20 questions, I ain't saying nothing. Spider-Man sighs, fine. I'll just check the giant vault over there. Wait, no, 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 no. Spider-Man sees an empty briefcase and a little cat doll on it. And he asks, did she just string me along? Suddenly the vault door slams shut and Spider-Man shouts asking, was it a lie? Was everything a lie? Black Cat tells him that she's sorry, but she did need help pulling this one off. Spider-Man tells her to do the right thing. Turn those drives over to the police, but Black Cat stops him. No. I've earned these. Besides, Hammerhead is the real threat. I just slowed him down a bit. As more of Hammerhead's men arrive, they charge in while Black Cat slips away and begins to open up the vault. When they see the drive gone, they call Hammerhead telling him that it's gone, and so is Black Cat. And on the phone, Hammerhead says to find the cat and kill her. If she's stupid enough to go back to her penthouse, I've got a little surprise for her. Later, after sneaking out, Spider-Man swings over to her apartment. He finds Black Cat humming to herself as she gets ready to enter. Spider-Man screams for her to stop, but as she grips the handle, she looks back. What is... Before she could finish, the entire rooftop explodes. Spider-Man rushes down to try and find Black Cat. It was a bomb! If anyone could survive that, it could be her! He begins tossing bits of rubble aside, looking for any sign of Black Cat. But as a pillar falls down, he catches it, shouting, She's not dead! As the firefighters make their way in, Spider-Man yells that there is a woman down there. Her name is Felicia. You need to find her. The firefighters tell Spider-Man he has to leave. Watanabe then messages him, stating that he needs to get out now. So, moments later, outside, Watanabe says, Does he care to explain what the hell he was doing in the exploded apartment? Spider-Man walks past her, telling her no. I don't care to explain, but we'll talk about it later. At that moment, MJ runs up hugging him, stating that she saw the news and she is so, so sorry. Spider-Man says that people will see her, hugging him. And MJ tells him that she doesn't care, she isn't letting go. With the supposed death of Black Cat, weeks came and went. MJ used her sources to figure out what's going on with Hammerhead. Hammerhead was using stolen intel and capital to blackmail the other Magia family heads and leverage the fear to take control of the city's organized crime families. Spider-Man and Silver Sable are now in open war with Hammerhead and his forces as Hammerhead continues to terrorize the city armed with stolen Sable International enhancement suits. With that being said, tensions between Spider-Man and Sable are at an all-time high, and there's no end in sight. So one day during a chase, Sable flies her jet through the city with Spider-Man asking what she's even thinking. She can't pilot that here. He lands on the windshield of the jet and Sable tells him to get out of the way. Hammerhead is right where she wants him. Then Hammerhead jumps onto the jet laughing, stating, Oh, it's been a while, bug. How do you like the upgrades? 
Spider-Man says that it's a little ostentatious for his liking. Though mech suits are pretty cool. Hammerhead laughs again, telling him that they're gonna have to thank the cat for him. When he sees her, of course. Spider-Man flings himself forward, telling him, I am not in a flirty mood. I just want to end this. Hammerhead punches him in the face, telling him, All right, let's end it then. He holds on to Spider-Man, pinning him down next to the propeller, pushing his head closer, telling him that it's time to go splat. Spider-Man struggles to push his head up, webbing onto the rotors, pulling on it hard, shifting the flight path and allowing himself to get up. He jumps up, punching into Hammerhead, shouting, you do not get to talk about her. He punches over and over until the fabric on his gloves is tearing away and Hammerhead stops him. What, you mad? Let me take care of that. He grabs onto Spider-Man's head and Sable climbs out opening fire, telling him that this is exactly why she doesn't do partners. Sable swings back, smacking Sable, telling her to knock it off already. And as he grabs a hold of both Spider-Man and Sable, he says, oh, this must be my lucky day. Two for one, say nighty night. But a familiar voice tells him, okay, nighty night. Black Cat jumps onto Hammerhead with him asking, how? And Spider-Man is stunned. You're alive? She tells him, yeah, and kicking. What good are nine lives if you can't burn a few? Moments later, Sable's jet comes crashing down and as Sable pulls herself out of the burning wreckage, Hammerhead rips through stating, I knew this new suit was slick, but this is just stupid. Black Cat grabs Spider-Man running off stating that she loves him and all, but he is way heavier than he looks. Like, how do you do that all the time? Spider-Man rubs his head stating that he has the proportionate strength of a spider. People forget that. But more importantly, she's alive? Black Cat laughs, telling him, of course she is. You didn't really think I was dead, did you? Anyway, what are you doing right now with Hammerhead? That's a big mistake. Take this flash drive. It's everything that you need to know to beat the big ugly. So maybe now we're even? Spider-Man takes the drive, telling her maybe. But as Black Cat leaves, she says that there's one thing to know. Hammerhead's head, it's not as strong as you think. A couple weeks later, on top of Sable International Aircraft Carrier, Hammerhead attacks again, stating that it's a real cute thing of them teaming up. But it ain't gonna work. Spider-Man jumps out of the way as another blast comes by, asking Sable if he can get some help here. From up on her jet, she says to just get him into position and she'll be ready shortly. So Hammerhead charges at Spider-Man, and as Spider-Man jumps over him, he webs up Hammerhead's head, pulling it back. And a second later, a laser fires hitting Hammerhead on the side of the head as he screams out in pain. He then smacks Spider-Man off of his back, asking, what the hell was that? I'm gonna murder both of you. As Hammerhead tries to stomp on Spider-Man, Spider-Man jumps out of the way, telling Sable that he still seems pretty angry with them. Sable swoops in, dropping bombs along the carrier, and Hammerhead asks if they really think that the bombs are going to stomp him. Spider-Man swings through, telling him that it's sort of a fingers crossed situation. Low expectations, but they're definitely hoping. As Spider-Man webs him back up, he yells to Sable to hit him again, but she calls back that the laser won't be charged in time. Just hold him still. Spider-Man pulls back on Hammerhead, telling her, you know, it's not like we're gonna keep him here indefinitely or anything. Sable opens up her cockpit, pointing the jet downward, jumping out just as the jet goes flying into Hammerhead with a loud ba-boom. And just a short bit away on the wall, Spider-Man says, yeah, don't worry about me getting hit by the jet or anything. She walks up, opening fire with her guns drawn, telling him that she wasn't worried. And Hammerhead begins to crawl out of the fire, but before he can make it out, he finally collapses. Sable then tells Spider-Man that they're going to need to thank his attractive cat friend for the intel. Spider-Man says they probably won't have to. He's pretty sure she's out there right now thanking herself. And over at the docks, Black Cat laughs, stating that the man knows her too well. As the police arrive, Black Cat says, all right, now that everyone's here, it's time to put on the big show. Across the way, Spider-Man helps the police load Hammerhead into a truck when he sees Black Cat jump down and steals a police car. He quickly chases after her, asking what is she thinking, and she asks, what does he think? She's thieving! As she races through the streets, Spider-Man webs onto the car, climbing up, pushing Black Cat aside, telling her, I've had enough! This stops now! He tells him that he might want to slow down. They're coming in a little hot. And at that moment, his spider sense begins to kick in, but before Spider-Man could stop the car, the two go crashing into a barricade. The police surround the car, yelling to get out of the car, and Spider-Man holds up his arm, stating that it's just him. Sorry about the mess. Just having a little snafu here. You can go ahead and apprehend the thief. Black Cat, these nice people are here too. Well, this is awkward. He looks at the empty car and then turns back to the officers, telling them that there really was a lady in here, a criminal lady. Black Cat, you know Black Cat. 
But while Spider-Man is dealing with the police, Black Cat sneaks into the evidence lockers back at the station, stealing a very specific item. Later that night, at the docks, she makes her way counting the giant steel containers until she finds the one she's looking for. She cuts the lock, opening up the door, stating, Oh, Hammerhead, you generous man, you. The combined wealth of all five Magia families, and you left it all to me. Involuntarily, but still. As she grabs a hold of some of the money spread across the table, smelling it, a voice tells her, You know, they say cash has more filthy germs on it than a public toilet. Black Cat looks back, seeing MJ standing there, and MJ goes on telling her, I get most of the plan. Help Hammerhead take out the other families, then fake your death to send him on a collision course to kill both Spidey and Sable. Run off with all the loot in the aftermath. It makes sense. The part I don't get is, why did you need one of Doc Ock's claws? Black Cat tells her money. Deep pocketed collector wanted it and she had a handy distraction. But how did she find out about all of this? MJ tells her that Hammerhead had a series of shell companies that owned property all over the city. And from there, it was a process of elimination. Black Cat then asks, what is the plan? Knock her out, drag her back. MJ calmly says that that wouldn't end very well. Fortunately, she doesn't have much ego wrapped up in martial arts. Black Cat scoffs, telling her that she guesses this solves the mystery of how someone so painfully boring manages to keep the spider entertained. And MJ laughs. Ha <laughs> ha! Right! My spider! Before and after. Black Cat stops her attack and tells her, well, the man has good taste. Credit where credit's due. Problem is, how are you planning on keeping me here? MJ tells her that she doesn't. But before the police arrest her, what is the point of stealing all this stuff if you never keep anything anyway? Black Cat begins to run, telling her that it's like she told the boy so long ago. She doesn't steal the stuff for stuff. And several thwips can be heard as Spider-Man webs a Black Cat, finishing her sentence. She does it for the thrill. Spider-Man then hangs upside down, stating, You know, we make a pretty good team. And MJ asks if it's weird that she kind of likes Black Cat. Spider-Man says, nah. Inexplicable likability. That's a Black Cat superpower. MJ pulls down Spider-Man's mask, kissing him, stating that... He still likes her more though, right? And as Black Cat is taken away, she looks back stating that it's so adorable. And there's another full story right here at the Comic Story and Full Story channel. This is a channel where we just re-upload some of our underperforming ones from the other channel to appease the algorithm and see if we have a channel that only does full stories, how that would affect things. I hope you guys enjoyed it, but don't forget you can get up-to-date brand new videos by joining the main channel, Comic Story. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.